आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy in a lot of our podcasts we talk about data we talk about regulations regarding data we talk about data privacy who is collecting your data and what's done with your data Today we are going to be looking at a different aspect of data, um, namely how data is transmitted and how the movements of packets of data can make or break economies. Um, I have with me today Aditya Parikh. Welcome, Aditya. It's a pleasure to be here, Anurudh. So, um, Aditya, you recently had a document out about India's submarine cables. Uh, but before we get into actually discussing the document, let's talk a little bit uh, more generally about flows of data. The world that you and I inhabit um, is, is an extremely complex one, and one thing that really keeps it going is the constant exchange of massive amounts of information uh, from different parts of the world. You're not just talking about uh, financial information; you're talking about personal information. Really, the the ebb and flow of these tides is really uh, what makes the modern world as interconnected as it really is but what really enables the flow of data i think that um, just generally when a lot of us think about uh, data being transmitted from one place to another we think of this cartoony satellite uh, and like data being beamed up and beamed down from it uh, but to what extent is is that image really true um, how is the information that underpins uh the networks of exchange that make our modern world um how is this information actually transmitted uh from one place to another well i'm glad we're starting on that point because uh, honestly the image that most of our communications are going through satellites uh isn't exactly correct in fact to to the contrary uh, about 97% of all global communications are carried by uh, submarine telecom cables and just about less than 3% of all uh these communications are carried by satellite systems and other systems as well so it really is a situation where uh the general public has a different world view from what the reality is of uh, uh, data communication in the world today and what kind of quantities are we talking about in terms of data and like how how are submarine cables more broadly uh, laid who owns them like are they owned by uh, national governments or uh, are they owned by private corporations who pays for them uh, who maintains them i can imagine that to transmit the kind of data, quantities that uh, would be required to keep stuff running you would require cables that have some pretty extraordinary capacities and those kind of things wouldn't be easy to make so when we talk about to uh, the ownership of uh, the cables and the infrastructure that uh, supports them so india is currently connected to the world with 17 active international submarine cables and supporting them are 15 landing stations which would obviously make landfall in coastal indian cities which are mumbai cochin trivandrum chennai tuticorin and to uh, surprisingly these cables are uh, not owned by the government uh, even if they are vital national infrastructure which enables the government to have international communications domestic communications just about uh, the whole nine yards but surprisingly they're owned kept up and tended to by private consortium partners so the private sector has a bigger say in what happens to these cables uh coming to the specifics the five major players in india are tata communications who have seven active cables five landing stations which they have some part in or own completely and they also have the uh, highest bandwidth capacity by uh, the landing station if i recall correctly and airtel which has four active uh, cables and uh, three landing stations uh coming to reliance jio which is probably the biggest sensation in our telecom business uh, right now they have three active cables two landing stations and one more landing station is coming up and when we talk about the international arena global cloud exchange is also a big player so they have uh, three active cables which are connecting us and uh, two landing stations which they have uh, some part in 
and uh, since the andaman nicobar uh, and chennai cable has been talked about in the media as vital infrastructure uh, since it's a domestic cable uh, it has less of an impact internationally but still it's important to our uh, national bandwidth i'd say so bsnl uh, happens to be the only indirect way in the uh, in which the indian government uh, somehow controls some submarine cables so two cables are currently uh owned by bsnl in part as well as completely so the andaman nicobar and chennai cable is owned by bsnl completely but the uh, bharat lanka cable system which connects india and sri lanka uh, is owned uh, in partnership with the uh, state teleco company in sri lanka it's kind of interesting to me how um there's there seems to be a reputation of history in a way almost right just as um economic and financial a quote and quote information used to be traded um, along india's coast in terms of actual physical goods and luxury items um we're again seeing like the same old routes uh, namely across the arabian sea uh, between india and lanka and then from india again uh, to the rest of east asia kind of being replicated uh, with the submarine cables but aditya so you mentioned that a lot of these cables are privately owned right what i want to understand from you is how uh, private ownership of cables kind of gels with uh, coastal defense so i'm sure that um, a lot of navies and specifically the indian navy uh, must have some very restrictive uh, ideas on what can actually happen in coastal waters if for example there is some kind of uh, damage that happens to a submarine cable um then what happens like does the private sector have some kind of conduit to the national security apparatus that allows them to go out there um and repair these cables or is that a privilege that only bsnl has or does even bsnl not have that uh well actually uh when we talk about to uh, restoration capability and the laws that govern it so uh since submarine cables are not exactly tied to a country's territory they have their uh, existence in uh on the seabed they are also transiting through a country's territorial waters in to another country's territorial waters in the easy of more than one countries so it's really a long chain any part of which if it fails the whole system fails uh not taking into consideration uh the redundancies and backup cables so my point is the uh international law part of it which would give you some sort of a guideline although not all states uh equally treat international law uh the same way we do so i would say unclos is something the united nations convention on the law of the sea is something that you should look at first uh whenever you are in doubt about international maritime matters so unclos has pretty clear uh, directions of uh, how you're supposed to lay these cables how you're supposed to tend to them uh, but it doesn't talk about what happens in warfare so as far as unclos is concerned it does not restrict the capability of any nation state from targeting another country's uh, submarine cable infrastructure so uh, putting that aside restoration capability is something that differs from every consortium every company to every uh, country its administration so for india's case uh, in our domestic scenario we have made it uh, clear that any ship that is going to tend to repair or uh, look after in any sort of way uh, one of the cables that are passing through our territorial waters or eec they will have to fly the indian flag they would have to be registered in india because this way there would be no caveat of international law that would conflict with our own domestic laws so anything uh, that can be carried out by that ship would be subject to indian law so we have in effect to uh, prioritized security over a speed of restoration because you know the consortium partners since they are private business players they are looking at efficiency they are looking at flexibility in hiring whatever ships they can get rather than uh, keeping uh, a big hulky asset like a repair ship uh, always on alert uh, which they own so that eats up into their profits and this is something that the indian government has chosen to prioritize security over which is commendable absolutely uh, it's just that we uh, we should have a balance approach that to uh, where 
since our national security is also tied up to these cables uh, being effective all the time uh, since every minute lost in today's economy where after uh, covid uh, most of uh, most of the world's business has shifted online so i think the government has to understand that every minute lost to uh, our our connectivity being lost uh, is a huge loss to our uh, economy those are some very interesting points right there and like what i'd like to kind of like emphasize is that um submarine cables aren't invulnerable right so there's a lot of things that could potentially damage them um you get into this in a lot more detail in your document uh, but one thing that i'd like you to kind of touch upon while we're kind of exploring this trade off between um security and literally <laughs> the entire economy functioning is what could be a, a hostile actors uh, game plan when it comes to submarine cables right we've done a lot of episodes on all things policy about how uh, china is increasingly um, getting more and more of a foothold in the indian ocean china has logistics facilities uh, in the indian ocean it clearly has the capability to actually uh, project power into the indian ocean uh, in a way that india doesn't necessarily have uh, for the south china sea or the east china sea um so potentially what kind of risks could a hostile actor pose uh, to a submarine cable i'm just asking this because i want to better understand um the security aspect um of the risk to submarine cables well you know we would have to start with history when we talk about uh, history itself china comes quite a bit later so in warfare there is a precedent that to uh, submarine cables became become the first casualties of war Uh, for example in world war 1 the royal navy snipped the uh, transatlantic cable connecting germany to the uh, rest of the world there is another example in the cold war with the operation uh, ivy bells where uss halibut uh, went and spied on soviet uh, telegraph cables in soviet territorial waters the sea of otsk uh, if i'm pronouncing that correctly so uh, there is ample precedent that to states with their military as well as civilian assets would try to uh, uh, conduct espionage as well as try to disconnect the country uh, from all communications if possible uh, during warfare or even peace time so uh, the uss halibut to uh, slash iv uh, operation iv bells incident happened in peace time so the thing is we have conclusive evidence that china has tried it a few times to encroach into our uh, easy at least and uh, collect hydrographical data uh, they could have spied on our cables as well uh, there was an incident uh, recently where they dumped a few uh, underwater drones which they later retrieved in the andaman sea and uh, uh, there was an incident where a, a chinese hydrographic ship it came and dropped the anchor and the indian navy had to chase it away give it warnings and uh, they eventually left uh, after which the chief of naval staff uh, uh, said during a press conference that were very clear that you have to have 12 days uh, advance notice from us that yeah you've been granted permission only then you can come in and uh, perform whatever research work you want to do but this business of uh, conducting second uh, operations under the guise of uh, uh, research just doesn't work so there is a clear and present danger of chinese espionage in our territorial waters in our uh, easies if we let them in interesting so you have a whole bunch of recommendations on like how exactly india can tackle this aditya um, and i think one of the big things that you are focusing on is actually um, just being more situationally situationally aware uh, of what is happening in the indian ocean um, for uh, an area of the world that is ostensibly named after our country it's quite surprising how much china managed to get up to there uh, without our knowledge um but uh, there's a whole package really of of measures that you're recommending right so mm-hmm. um it's not just about um s- sensors and knowing what is happening on the sea floor um but also a whole plethora of other stuff including uh, more patrolling of course let's not get into too much detail here because uh, we'd like to leave our listeners with something to actually read in the document uh, but can you broadly take us through um how you propose um that this trade off between 
um, maintaining um, the functioning of the economy at all costs uh, versus maintaining security uh, of the submarine cables, even though it can be an expensive and tedious task. Uh, how best do you think this trade-off can be managed? I think the trade-off uh, really is something that uh, comes at a level which at which I, I don't really think I should be the authority. I can only make recommendations. So uh, personally, I would recommend just four things broadly that you would enhance your maritime domain awareness. That is the biggest uh, takeaway from uh, the research work that I have put in. That uh, maritime domain awareness is very central to our security and uh, national prosperity. So uh, my idea is basically that uh, you would raise the restoration capability by providing the private consortium owners with better fiscal incentives because most of the times that is the main thing that they're after. So uh, you can have them follow the rules, maintain ships which are uh, registered under the Indian flag and uh, give them tax breaks or subsidies somewhere else. The third thing that I would say is that to, uh, the Indian forces, although they've taken up quite a good amount of uh, surveillance duties post the unfortunate uh, attack of 26-11, uh, they've taken up patrolling in coastal areas quite seriously. And it shows that our security has improved. But I would still say that to, uh, our Industrial infrastructure. See, uh, CISF protects just about every uh, vital part of India's uh, national industrial infrastructure, be it private, semi-private, semi-government or uh, completely a PSU. So I think submarine cables, since they are vital to uh, our national prosperity and the communications of the government, both domestic and international, uh, should also uh, protect specifically submarine cables. So they should maybe have a proper detachment or a department uh, in their hierarchy, which is specifically uh, charged with protecting uh, submarine cables. Although I understand that landing stations are already protected by the Coast Guard, uh, pra uh, Sagar Prahari Bal of the Indian Navy and uh, the Marine Police Force that was set up post-2611. So the idea is that there should be a higher focus on uh, patrolling and the thorough familiarity of these patrolmen who would be, for uh, better or worse, our first uh, line of defense against saboteurs. The biggest uh, recommendation that I would make is that the Indian Navy, since it's already uh, made the net security guarantor of uh, uh, all things maritime for India, uh, and in the region it aspires to be that, so I think SOSUS, the, uh, a comprehensive array of hydrophones and sooner boys, uh, an all encompassing sound surveillance system, uh, akin to what the US Navy used to have, uh, uh, in the Cold War. Something like that for the Indian Ocean region, something like that for, uh, India's own territorial waters in EEZ. Uh, although we have begun efforts with, uh, uh, at least four harbor defense systems at the moment. And they're quite cost effective, but their uh, force multiplier effect, their surveillance multiplier effect, their uh, multiplier effect in terms of maritime domain awareness goes far beyond just the security of uh, submarine cables. It's something that the government of India, the Indian Navy, and we as a nation should prioritize quite a bit, I think. So in conclusion, I'd say my recommendations can only go so far. A single researcher can only go so far. But these are the points that I'd uh, really appreciate if the uh, Indian government, the strategic community at large uh, also address so that our country can uh, remain connected to the rest of the world and prosper. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Aditya. Um, for all of our listeners, I recommend you take a look at Aditya's research. Um, it's got some very interesting numbers and facts about just how important uh, submarine cables are and the risks and threats um, that they potentially face and the consequences uh, of not uh, following some of the recommendations and ideas that he's proposing. Um, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Aditya, for joining us. Thank you so much, Anirudh, for having me. Uh, and thank you for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I want to remind our Tamil-speaking audience about the new show from Kadai Podcast. The previous season was Punyan Selvan. The new show that we're doing is Sivakamyan Sabata. Kavita Jiva is the host of the show. Basically, what she does is she retells these old classics in a modern idiom. I think you'll really enjoy that. Quickly running through some of the other guests that we had this week, Luke Coutinho showed up on Cyrus Says, where he and Cyrus had a great conversation about fitness and all things related to that. Rahul Dakuna was on Gauri Devi Deyal's show. This rounds on me. Again, great conversation around brands and things like that. Maruki Nayat had Kaveri Banzai on her show to discuss Sushant Singh Rajput's death and the effect it's going to have on Bollywood as it goes forward. Arshna Vora, who is a director of small and medium businesses at Facebook, she was on Advertising is Dead talking about the kinds of work that Facebook is doing with smaller businesses. And remember, Edges and Sledges continues as fan series. Do definitely check that out. And last, one final thing, that Cock and Bull this week was really interesting. Cyrus, Kunal Vijaykar, Gauri Devideyal and myself spoke quite a bit about the restaurant industry and the challenges that they're facing in this pandemic. Pandemic. So do definitely check that out. I think you'll enjoy that. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Entertainment is like food for the brain. It's a window to culture and a great way to understand the world around us. The internet has changed what it means to be an entertainer, creating new storytellers with millions of fans. It has spawned a new breed, the story sellers, those behind the scenes creating the business for this ecosystem. They work with brands, platforms and channels who are keen to capitalize on an audience hungrier than ever for more stories. I am Vineet Kanabar and I have a ringside view to how stories are told and sold. On my show, I bring you creators, artists, executives and marketers for a freewheeling conversation around the business of entertainment. Tune in to Storytellers and Storysellers for personal stories, analysis and criticism every Thursday as I talk to the brightest minds telling or selling great stories today.